ब्लीडिंग और जी आई ब्लीडिंग नाउ इन द बिगिनिंग वी हैव टू डिफ्रेंशिएट वट इज अपर जी आई ब्लीडिंग एंड वट इज लोअर जी आई ब्लीडिंग नाउ शी है अपर जी आई ब्लीडिंग इज ब्लीडिंग विच अकर्स प्रोक्सिमल टू द लिगामेंट ऑफ ट्रीज proximal to the ligament of trees and lower gi is bleeding which occurs distal to the ligament of trees distal and proximal now now what is this ligament of trees isn't it let's talk about this quickly ligament of trees we need to understand otherwise all this classification is very confusing Okay, focus here. This is ligament of trees. Let me use a pointer for you. See here. No, this is duodenum. Not it. This is duodenum. This is a second part of the duodenum. This is third part of the duodenum, which is horizontal, and this is the fourth part of the duodenum, and then jejunum will start. now the junction of duodenum and jejunum is called duodeno jejunal flexor duodeno jejunal flexor from that duodeno jejunal flexor okay one fibrotic band is going up towards the diaphragm this is what we are talking about this fibrotic band is going towards the diaphragm this is called ligament of trees okay it is not attached to any bone there so the term ligament is a misnomer here okay but it is a fibrotic band so upper gi bleeding proximal to the ligament of trees and it can present as hematomesis and melina and lower gi bleeding usually presents as hematochezia so we'll explain all these terms in the subsequent slide now see there hematomesis what do you mean by that hematomesis is vomiting of fresh blood or coffee ground blood this coffee ground blood is blood which is altered by gastric acid now it really depends what is the amount of bleeding going on inside the stomach or first part of the duodenum if the amount is uh, you know brisk or massive amount then the acid which is present in the stomach cannot alter all that blood so even fresh blood can be vomited very easy meaning is there if the amount of blood is not that much then that blood can be converted into something known as acid hematin okay acid hematin let me write that term for you acid hematin so because of this acid hematin it looks coffee ground in color now in general esophageal and gastric sources cause hematomesis and duodenal sources causes melina okay esophageal and gastric sources cause hematomesis and a duodenal source is called melina but gastric can cause melina as well because some of the blood may go distally and come out as a melanotic stool let's move on what is melina then i'm sure many student know this by now okay but still some extra information you may get here melina refers to black and tarry stool okay black and tarry stool tarry means sticky black and sticky stool okay? that usually result from upper gi bleeding it represents bleeding anywhere from oropharynx to the duodenum up to the ligament of trees okay so in other word this blood has to come in contact with hydrochloric acid then only it can turn into melanotic stool 
mixer of the blood with stool as well as the acid digestion of hemoglobin are responsible for the color and consistency of the melanotic stool okay let me highlight again this is black stool this is tarry and this is very very foul smelling these are the three important points of melina and these are the question which you should ask to your student, uh, uh, to your patient sorry ask to your patient when you take the history okay now don't ask hey do you have melina because they don't know what's what is that question so you have to convert that into the language which they understand okay and ask what type of stool you have can you describe if that word which you want is not coming ask some leading question to them ask about the color of the stool okay ask about the stickiness and foul smelling normally stool is foul smelling okay but in this case i'm talking about more foul smelling than before now about 50 ml of blood can produce melina so you don't need much blood there about 50 ml is enough and one interesting point is it may persist for 2 to 3 weeks after massive hemorrhage until the total evacuation is complete means it may remain inside the lower gi tract for considerable time on the other hand on the other hand what do you mean by hematochezia so hematochezia is a feature of lower gi hemorrhage and this is passage of red blood on the stool so see there passage of stool containing red blood rather than tarry stool is called hematochezia and it is a very important feature of lower gi hemorrhage but sometimes even upper gi hemorrhage may uh, cause hematochezia now how do we explain that it all depends on how briskly the upper gi bleeding is occurring brisk means massive faster so that there is no time for the change into melina it is quickly you know coming downwards and then come out as a bright red blood so it all depends on what is the amount of bleeding how fast the bleeding is happening and what is the intestinal transit time if the transit time is rapid then that fresh blood may come out as a hematochezia so you should exactly answer like this it is a hallmark of lower gi bleeding there is no doubt about it but exceptionally in upper gi bleeding also it can occur if the amount or rate of the bleeding is higher and faster now with this background knowledge let's talk about what are the causes of gi bleeding what are the disease or what are the condition which leads to gi hemorrhage in the neonet let's start from the neonet now swallowed maternal blood is one of the important cause at the time of birth okay they may swallow maternal blood the blood may be there in the oral cavity and at the time of birth they may swallow it and later on they will vomit it and when they vomit okay it almost looks like a coffee colored alteration in the blood and this is hematemesis another way is when they breastfeed if the mother's nipple is cracked or sore okay a little bit of blood may go into their stomach and the acid will change that blood again they can vomit it this is called hematemesis so this is a swallowed maternal blood and sometimes in the exam we can give a clinical situation or scenario like this okay so don't get confused another cause in neonate is coagulopathy coagulopathy Now, these are the common causes of coagulopathy hemorrhagic disease of the newborn which is caused by vitamin k deficiency vitamin k is very essential for some of the clotting or coagulation factor activation like 2 7 9 and 10 so without them there can be severe hemorrhage septicemia and dic are some other causes of coagulopathy sepsis can itself lead to dic and in sepsis platelet cannot function well so there is a high chance of bleeding and we all know about disseminated intravascular coagulation 
which is known as consumption coagulopathy. The clotting factor and platelets are consumed, but they are used up so that there is relative deficiency which can lead to hemorrhage. Another is hemophilia, okay? factor 8 and factor 9 deficiency. Now, another cause of GI bleeding in case of neonate is stress ulcer or gastritis, which occur in critically ill newborn. Now, this stress ulcer or gastritis can form in any severely ill patients, any. Okay, so this can occur in newborn as well. Now, there is a role of drug intake by the mother, like warfarin, aspirin, or sometimes by the neonate itself, endomethacine and steroid. Now, sometimes mother, we prescribe this drug to the mother for different diseases, and they can simply go towards the baby and can result in hemorrhage. Okay, warfarin, anticoagulant, and aspirin is antiplatelet drug. And sometimes we need to prescribe this type of medicines to the infant also. Endomethacin, you all know, in case of, in which disease we give endomethacin? PDA. 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 Very PDA. good. PDA. Very good, very good. And excellent, PDA, okay? So this is one of the drug, first drug actually in PDA management we want to give. But this is uh, NSAID, okay? It has antiplatelet activity. So it can result in hemorrhage if there is a high dose. And corticosteroid can also do the similar type of thing. Vascular malformations like hemangioma and AB malformations are some other causes because they can easily rupture and they can lead to hemorrhage. Let's move on. Now, let's go to infant. After neonate, what are the causes in infant? Mucosal erosion, probably by reflux esophagitis. Okay, it can bleed. And this is an esophageal source of hemorrhage now. Okay. Again, the same sort of coagulation okay. disorder. Again, the uh, same sort of... Please mute yourself. Okay, now there won't be any disturbance. Now, first is reflux esophagitis. Mucosal erosion may occur in esophagus and it can bleed. The second may be coagulation disorder. The same sort of coagulation disorder which we list in uh, neonate. And some other may be infection, infection in the intestine like bacterial or amoebic enteritis, intersusception. Okay, intersusception can develop ischemia of the bowel and ischemic bowel can bleed easily. Midgut valvulus, again a cause of ischemia. Mikkels diverticulum, there is ectopic presence of parietal cell in the Mikkels diverticulum and they can cause the production of hydrochloric acid which is damaging there that can bleed. Milk protein allergy because of inflammation it can also bleed and AB malformation can rupture easily. So all of these we, we can give reasons for GI bleeding. Now some of them can lead to upper GI hemorrhage and many of them can lead to lower GI hemorrhage. Okay, let's move on. Now, what about the causes in children? In children, one of the important cause is from the nose, that is epistaxis. Now, epistaxis is bleeding from the nose. If they swallow that nasal blood, now, in which situation they swallow? Okay, listen carefully here. There are two types of epistaxis, anterior and posterior. Now, anterior epistaxis means it comes from the anterior part of the nose. And posterior means from the nasal cavity, it is going backward towards the nasopharynx. Now, from the nasopharynx, it will go to the oropharynx and that child will swallow that blood. It reaches the stomach. Now, when it reaches the stomach, Okay, the person cannot digest his own blood. They will definitely vomit it out. And it will already change its color into coffee ground color. So this is one of the cause of hematomesis. So we should take a very good history here. 
to diagnose it. Reflux esophagitis, gastric erosion, gastritis or peptic ulcer disease are some other causes. All of these can lead to hemorrhage. Okay, all of these can lead to bleeding or hemorrhage. Esophageal varices in a bigger children. Who knows? There is a cirrhosis of the liver, or there is portal hypertension, and as a result of that, esophageal varices are already there in the lower part of the esophagus. They may rupture, and there is a massive hematemesis. Coagulopathy, same type of causes, and even Mikkels diverticulum, colonic polyp, and Henoch Sonlian purpura. All of these are important causes of GI bleeding. This Henoch Sonlian purpura has four important features together. One is rashes. Second, abdominal pain, and that can lead to GI hemorrhage also. Third, renal involvement. That renal involvement can lead to hematuria and proteinuria. And the fourth one is arthralgia or arthritis. Okay, so uh, these are rashes. Abdominal involvement, kidney involvement, and joint involvement. The combination is Hanok Sonlian purpura. Now, after listing this etiology, now let's talk about how to identify the sites of GI bleeding. This is a big challenge for the doctors. From where it is happening? So, we should take help of some important history physical examination and investigation. If there is effortless bright red blood from the mouth, effortless, okay, bright red blood, then what are the causes? See here, nasopharyngeal or oral lesion, okay, nasopharyngeal or oral lesion, they are very, you know, for example, these lesions are occurring on the upper part of the airway, nasopharynx or even the upper part of the GI tract. Tonsillitis, esophageal varices, very important cause, massive hemorrhage occur. Laceration of the esophagus or gastric mucosa or the junction of lower part of the esophagus and upper part of the stomach, which is called mallory wish syndrome or mallory wish tear. Now, in case of uh, children, this is not common because the most common cause of malaria wish uh, tear is alcohol intake or alcoholic people. But in adolescent, it can be seen, okay? Let's not ignore that fact. A pediatric age group also include adolescent. And though uh, theoretically, it is not a possibility, practically, it may be seen in few of the cases. If there is vomiting of bright red blood or of coffee ground blood, then it has come from stomach or duodenum because already acid has changed the blood. And this is known as acid hematin. Acid hematin. Now, if the person is passing melanotic stool or melina, then what's the meaning? The bleeding has come from the area which are proximal to the ligament of trees. No doubt about it. Without the contact of hydrochloric acid, melina cannot be there. So this is very important point. And the blood loss should be in excess of 50 to 100 ml in 24 hour, then only it can come out in the stool. So melanotic stool. Now, another question, and this, this is the answer you got from the patient. Patient says there is bright red or dark red blood in the stool. Okay. Bright red or dark red. Then the lesion may be in ileum or colon. Okay. Ileum or colon. These are the part of lower GI tract. And for exception, so many times I have talked about this, even massive upper GI bleeding can lead to bright red blood in the stool. This is called hematochagia. This dark red blood, you should not confuse this with melina, okay? Melina is completely black. This is dark red blood, means it is not come in contact with acid, okay? 
and because of the time because of the time gap okay it just look a little bit darker okay, this it is still a red type of blood so this is still a part of hematochezia another question if you ask what is the you know, type of blood on a stool and if the patient say on the surface of the stool there is a streak of blood a stool is usually hard and on the surface of stool there is a streak of blood that means it is probably coming from the rectal ampulla or anal canal or you can simply say from the rectum or anal canal and one of the commonest cause for this is hemorrhoid okay hemorrhoid hemorrhoid is also known as piles now after asking this important question let's uh, go and examine this child what are the physical examination finding we always start with the vital sign because this is a case of hemorrhage never forget this always make sure this child is stable stable means vital signs are within normal range okay there is no real danger to the life immediately this is called stable child so check the heart rate or the pulse rate measure the blood pressure count the respiratory rate take the temperature and if the child looks breathless then check the pulse oximetry as well now in this type this is a case of hemorrhage inside the gi tract so what are the important finding this topic is very very important okay now see here the child is having pallor the child looks pale it depends how much blood the child has lost there is diaphoresis means excessive sweating it is a feature of hypovolemia it is a feature of anemia because the sympathetic nervous system is stimulated confusion because of hypovolemia there is hypoperfusion of the brain tachycardia very very early features absolutely early feature in case of hemorrhage is tachycardia count the pulse rate or the heart rate and if it is higher for that age you should ask the question why it is high what is the reason probably this child is bleeding from somewhere in this case from gi tract tachypnea is also seen tachypnea means faster breathing rate isn't it and these are the features of shock in this case we are talking about hypovolemic or hemorrhagic shock now what about the blood pressure the blood pressure is still normal in the beginning when the child is not uh, bled that massively so one important point acute losses of 10 to 25 percent of the blood volume cause narrow pulse pressure and postural hypotension only postural hypotension still the blood pressure doesn't fall but if more than 40 percent of the intravascular volume is depleted then blood pressure will fall so what is the lesson to be learned listen it carefully here if blood pressure is normal okay uh, don't ignore the case and say oh this is not a very serious case still blood pressure is normal so this is not in shock this child is not in shock so i don't need to treat or i don't need to take it very seriously never there are two types of shock according to the seriousness okay one is called compensated shock and another is decompensated shock in compensated shock still the blood pressure is normal but in decompensated shock it is very late already blood pressure will fall so same thing happens here now let's examine some other body parts after these vital signs what are the other physical examination we are going to do on the skin <clears throat> examine for pallor icterus ecchymosis abnormal vessels and hydration status now all of the students should be able to give at least one reason here so pallor because this child is bleeding so pallor has to be examined icterus <clears throat> can anybody tell me why icterus should be examined here yes 
Sir, because of this, uh, any uh, liver diseases, cirrhosis of liver or chronic liver disease, so there will occur coagulopathy, so it will lead to GI bleeding. Very good. Excellent. Okay. That is the reason I want. Though there is a connection. Okay. So let's uh, restart. We are talking how to do physical examination in a case of GI hemorrhage. Now, before the break, we talk about what are the findings we examine on the skin. Now, we should look for pallor because this is a case of bleeding. We always do that. And even icterus because the liver disease is one of the commonest cause of upper GI hemorrhage, especially the chronic liver disease and cirrhosis of the liver, which is associated with icterus. And because of coagulopathy, it can lead to hemorrhage as well. Now, don't forget to look for echimosis, petechiae, and purpura. These may be present in bleeding as well as clotting disorders. Look for abnormal blood vessels on the skin, which, is, which are known as telangiectasia. Telangiectasia, and that telangiectasia may be associated with something known as hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, which may run in the family as an autosomal dominant disorder. And it is associated with a lot of uh, arteriovenous malformation inside the GI tract and even in internal organ. Check for the hydration status as well. Head, eyes, ear, nose, and throat should be examined, especially the nose and the throat, because epistaxis is one of the cause of upper GI hemorrhage. It is not exactly the cause of upper GI hemorrhage, but it comes in the differential diagnosis because patient may present as a hematomesis and we do not know from where it is coming. And make sure there is no bleeding from there. Now, examine the cardiovascular system. Okay, measure the heart rate or pulse rate in the lying and sitting position. And measure the blood pressure also in the same way, just to make sure Okay, this is not a case of postural hypotension. And postural hypotension is an early feature of hemorrhage. Measure the pulse pressure. Okay, pulse pressure is narrowed in case of hemorrhage. Now, uh, many students already know pulse pressure is the difference between systolic and diastolic pressure. Now, in case of hemorrhage, okay, because of the peripheral vasoconstriction, diastolic pressure is only slightly higher. So the gap between systolic and diastolic pressure is narrow. This is called narrow pulse pressure. It clearly tells us that, you know, compensatory mechanisms are activated and probably this is a case of hypovolemia. Examine for gallop rhythm and capillary refill time. Gallop rhythm is a feature of heart failure and capillary refill time is prolonged in hypovolemia. Examine the abdomen for organomegaly, like hepato, is splenomegaly. Now, if we take an example of cirrhosis of the liver again, in cirrhosis of the liver, because of portal hypertension, there is massive splenomegaly, but liver as such may be smaller in size. But when the stage is, has not reached cirrhosis, in case of some other chronic liver disease, the liver may be still bigger in size, okay? Only in cirrhosis it is shrunken. And examine for tenderness as well. If tenderness is present, probably uh, it is congested or it may be infected. Examine perineum for fistula and fissure. There may be a cause of lower GI hemorrhage, especially some streaky blood on the stool. And examine rectum for uh, gross bleeding or melina. And that is uh, uh, done by per rectal examination of the rectum. Okay. I should say digital examination of the rectum. This is another term. Okay. Uh, Done a globe and put your finger inside the rectum. And when you take out that finger, look, is there any black colored stool there or is there any stain of blood? These are important points. After doing the examination, let's talk about what are the lab evaluation we are going to do or lab investigation. We start with blood. Okay, like CBC and coagulation profile. I don't think any explanations are necessary here. Every student can give now. CBC, because we want to make sure this is a case of anemia or not. 
and CBC also tells us what is the platelet level. Coagulation profile, bleeding time, clotting time, okay, then prothrombin time and activated partial thromboplastin time. Always in the beginning, we do BT and CT, and if they are abnormal, then only go for other test. This is the way, not the opposite way, okay? Blood grouping and cross matching must be done. So most of the people know their blood grouping these days. Okay, uh, but that is not helping us. We must confirm it in our own lab, in our own hospital. Then only we believe what is the blood group. And then make ready, okay? Who can donate the blood? Are there any donor available? Maybe parents, maybe siblings, maybe some other relatives, maybe some friends. Who can donate the blood in crisis situation? I should identify that donor, donor early. Otherwise, if it is necessary, then we, we don't have time to you know, search for those donors. After donor is identified, cross match the blood, whether that donor blood is fit to transfuse in the patient or not. This is called cross matching. LFT and RFT are standard part of investigation, okay, all the time. LFT is very, very important than RFT in this case because liver disease can cause upper GI hemorrhage. But don't forget about renal function test also. If the bleeding is massive, there may be hypoperfusion to the kidney and that can uh, simply lead to alteration in renal function test. That means blood urea and serum, serum creatinine may be higher. Examine is stool for occult blood and there is one special type of test which is called app test. Okay, app test, APT test. It is done to differentiate between maternal and fetal blood. Now, let me give you that clinical scenario again. A newborn baby, okay, in the first day of life, in the first day of life, or maybe a few days later also it can happen, has vomited blood. Now, it is our job to make sure, is this the fetal blood, uh, is this the blood from the baby itself, or is it the swallowed blood from the mother side? Okay, is it the blood from the baby itself, or is it the swallowed blood from the mother? Now, how to do that? Let's talk about this test. This is called app test, and what we are doing, one part of the vomitus or stool, Okay, in this case, vomitus is mixed with five parts of distilled water and we centrifuge that. Now, after centrifuge, we take the supernatant, about one ml of supernatant, okay, uh, is added with sodium hydroxide. Then we wait for one to two minutes. If the solution changes to yellow brown in color, okay, if it changes to yellow brown in color see there carefully let me underline it so that it is easy for you to focus if the solution changes to yellow brown color it favors the possibility of swallowed maternal blood because hemoglobin a is denatured by alkali now the alkali in this sense is sodium hydroxide. This 1% sodium hydroxide is alkali, which, is, which we are mixing with the supernatant, that is with the blood. So hemoglobin A is denatured by alkali, but if uh, the color is not changed, then hemoglobin F okay, is there because it is resistant to denaturation by alkali. So what is the conclusion now? Let me tell you the conclusion. If there is no color change, it is hemoglobin F, okay? It is coming from the baby side. If there is change in color, this is hemoglobin A, and it is, come from, it is coming from the mother side. That is the conclusion. Now, apart from that, we do some localization study. And the most important of them is endoscopy, okay? Endoscopy. And this is called upper GI endoscopy or another name, esophago gastroduodenoscopy. 
because we are going to see esophagus, stomach, as well as duodenum, all of these. Now, what are the advantages of this localization study? Now, they allow prompt diagnosis and the ability to guide or perform therapy to hasten the cessation of bleeding. So number one, they help us to know from where hemorrhage is coming, so prompt diagnosis. Okay, and second one, they will also help us to stop this bleeding. Okay, they are therapeutic as well, diagnostic as well as therapeutic. Now, infants and children with anemia and positive occult blood in the stool, even in the absence of melina, okay, hematomesis or hematokagia, they often need upper GI endoscopy examination. See here, they are having anemia and we know they are bleeding slowly. That's why the stool local blood is positive. Even if they don't have melina, even if they don't have hematomesis or hematokagia, we, we have to go for upper GI endoscopy to make sure from where they are bleeding. Maybe from the upper GI tract, okay? So endoscopy will show you that. And this is a very, very necessary type of investigation in this type of cases. Now, after endoscopy, another uh, type of test we have is, see here, technetium 99M labeled RBC scan. Now, this is a radioisotope material. This radioisotope material is labeled with RBC and it is given to the patient. Now, what is the advantage of doing this? It can localize the site with hemorrhage even up to 0.1 ml per minute. So even the very slight amount of bleeding can be diagnosed by this special type of test. This is a very slight amount of hemorrhage, but still uh, it can diagnose. So it is very useful to diagnose mycal diverticulum because from the mycal diverticulum usually very slight amount of hemorrhage is going on. Okay, let me remind you, this mycal diverticulum is a congenital diverticulum which is present in the ileum, the antimicentric border. It is present in 2% of the people. It is two inch longer and it is present two feet proximal to the ileocecal junction. Okay, this is called rule of two. It has got ectopic gastric mucosa which can bleed. Now, another is upper GI contrast study. Okay, this contrast study are not very, uh, you know, useful type of study because they may obscure, they may obscure endoscopic and angiographic study because of this contrast material, it may block the site of bleeding. So it is not usually done in active cases of bleeding or some of the doctor even think this is not useful at all. Other investigations are ultrasonography of the abdomen, very, very important one, and it can show portal hypertension finding, okay? The portal hypertension finding may be seen there. Now, what are the uh, portal hypertension finding? One is splenomegaly, very, very important one. Other, the caliber of portal vein is bigger, means there is dilation of portal vein usually. Third, there may be some collateral development in case of portal hypertension. And fourth, what is the ecotexture of the liver? What's going on in liver? Is it a case of cirrhosis of the liver or not? All this information is provided by ultrasound. Very, very important test. Some other investigations are nasopharyngoscopy and CT scan of paranasal sinuses. Now, if you think uh, epistaxis is the cause of this bleeding, then go for it. Otherwise, it is not necessary. Chest X-ray. If you think hemoptysis is confused with hematomesis in this patient, sometimes it, it can happen, you know. When we ask the question, a patient say, Doctor, I'm not sure whether I coughed it out or I vomited it out. And coughing of blood is hemoptysis. 
vomiting of blood is hematemesis. So if patient is not sure by themselves that during that time we ask certain question and to confirm, probably we do some test like chest X-ray. Cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis, okay, chest X-ray has very important finding and we, we are sure this is a case of hemoptysis rather than hematemesis. Now, after doing all these important investigation and after the confirmation of the diagnosis and identifying the site of hemorrhage, let's go for the management. But the first thing, okay, all of you should understand is, this is a type of medical emergency. Okay, this is a type of medical emergency. This is a case of hemorrhage from the GI tract. So always take it seriously. So first thing is, I'll admit the child in the hospital at least for 24 hour, if not longer, at least. And then, okay, if the child is very sick, if the child is hypotensive, if the child is in coma, if the child is drowsy, okay, or confused, I will protect the airway of that child. Always A, B, and C. So airway protection is the first thing. And that is done by endotracheal intubation. Now, please remember one thing. If the child is not in coma, if the child is conscious, if the child can drink, child can eat, then you don't need to put endotracheal intubation in that child. That's not my point here. If the child cannot protect his or her own airway, then only you have to go for this type of management. See there? So to prevent aspiration considered in situation in which diminished mental status like shock, hepatic encephalopathy, massive hematomesis, or active variceal hemorrhage, in this, in this type of situation, we go for endotracheal intubation to protect the airway. Now B is a breathing. So probably this is not a you know, disease of lung, a respiratory tract or heart. So we presume bleeding would be normal here, okay? So let's directly go for circulatory management. So what, is, what are the different options you have? First is restoration of intravascular volume. So give a lot of IV fluid because this person is losing blood. This person is in shock. So large bore IV line are kept first and they are kept on both sides, on both hand actually. Central venous line should be established in, in very severe or overt type of, type of GI bleeding because we want to make sure we don't give a lot of IV fluid there. Now, which type of IV fluid? This is a case of hemorrhage. So always crystalloid. So always crystalloid. That is normal saline or ringer lactate. Any one of them is started. And how much? Okay, this is the question to every student and I'm sure they can answer from the topic of severe dehydration. is 20 ml per kg. So 20 ml per kg is the bolus. So we give it very fast. Then if it is not helping, we can repeat another two boluses, maximum three boluses can be given very safely. Still, if the blood pressure doesn't come up, then you have to go for colloid, colloid, and blood is a type of colloid. So this is the knowledge. Now, if you have not done a cross matching in the beginning, and you can go for O negative blood if it is available. But the problem is it is very rare type of blood group, very rare. If you are fortunate or lucky, then the donor is ready to donate O negative blood. Otherwise, okay, don't uh, you know, wait for this. You need to make sure that blood is available for the patient. Now, another important concept is correction of coagulopathy. If coagulopathy is the cause of upper GI bleeding, we go for the correction. See here, if anticoagulant is causing, stop it. Give fresh blood or fresh frozen plasma. Fresh frozen plasma is always preferable over fresh blood. Give vitamin K injection, especially in liver disease. 
and if there is a thrombocytopenia, transfuse the platelet. Especially if they are less than 50,000, then only. Because more than 50,000, they don't usually cause hemorrhage. This is the correction of coagulopathy. Now, let's go for the specific management according to the cause. If peptic ulcer is causing upper GI bleeding, go for the treatment of peptic ulcer. Like you can use PPI or S2 receptor antagonist or sucralfate, any type of drug. If esophageal varices is the cause of hemorrhage, okay, go for the treatment like somatostatin analog, okay, vasopressin, sclerosing agent, ligation or banding. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Okay, we are specifically concerned about management of esophageal varices. So we are going to repeat that again. If, if there are bleeding source which you can see with the help of endoscopy, go for the cauterization. It will stop the hemorrhage. It is called cauterization. If polyp is the cause for bleeding, go for polypectomy, remove it. Okay, and the important point here is management of varicell bleeding. Now let's talk about it because this is a absolutely important medical emergency. Now, before I go into that part, uh, all of the students should understand where are these portosystemic anastomosis or portocable anastomosis. Cable means it's a systemic site. It's an inferior vena cava, okay? We use the term cable for that. See here? Mm, let me use the, okay. Now see here, the first of them is lower end of the esophagus, right here. A zygous vein, okay? And these are the gastric vein. So there is a anastomosis here, lower end of the esophagus. Just know the site here, okay? Second, around the umbilicus, okay? Around the umbilicus. So it is right here, caput medusa. Third, in the rectum, okay? Third is the rectum. It is right here, rectum. Fourth, in the retroperitoneum. It is shown here, retroperitoneum. And fifth is called bare area of the liver, which is not shown here properly in the picture. So these are the site for porto cable anastomosis. There's another picture which is showing all these uh, different, uh, you know, site, lower third of the esophagus, para umbilical area, upper end of anal canal or lower part of the rectum, you can say, retroperitoneum and bare area of the liver. This is very, very favorite questions of any examiner, okay? So make sure all of you know this. Now, the esophageal varices means those anastomosis between, okay, those azygous vein tributaries and the uh, gastric veins, they are dilated and ruptured, leading to massive bleeding from there. Now, in that situation, the first thing is always resuscitation. So you start with crystalloid, give it in a good amount, like three times. If it is still, uh, the condition is not good, go for the colloid, that is RVCs or whole blood, okay? Uh, we prefer whole blood during that situation. And if you have already given enough fluid, then packed RVC can also be thought. Correct coagulopathy, vitamin K and fresh frozen plasma. Put a nasogastric tube just to make sure whether there is ongoing bleeding or not. And sometimes uh, we, we are afraid to put NG tube. We think it may cause rupture of those varices, but nothing like that will happen. So the purpose of keeping NG tube here is to make sure whether bleeding is uh, fresh or not. Use ranitidine, okay? Especially if peptic ulcer disease is the cause of hemorrhage. And one more other point, even in case of uh, esophageal varices, there is coexisting gastric erosion. So it is not a bad idea to use S2 blocker and it doesn't have that many uh, side effects as well. Now, what are the drugs we use to decrease the varicell bleeding? Okay, 
or let's talk about it. Now, look at the name of the medicine. Vasopressin, okay, nitroglycerin, and octreotide. Vasopressin, nitroglycerin, and octreotide. These are the medicine. This vasopressin has got vasoconstrictor activity on its planktonic arteriole so that it will decrease the portal blood flow and the pressure. And that helps during this bleeding condition. So in other words, it is decreasing portal pressure. But there are certain side effects of this vasopressin and one of the important side effects is in some of the older male, the cases have been reported, it can even lead to myocardial ischemia because of constriction of coronary arteries. So it can cause constriction of other arteries in the body. So if that is the problem, then we can use nitroglycerin with vasopressin. That may help. Nitroglycerin can also decrease the portal pressure. And octreotide is a somatostatin analog. It can decrease splanking blood flow. So this is one of the another favorite question of the examiner. Can you list what are the drugs we use in the management of variceal bleeding? These are the answer: vasopressin, nitroglycerin, and octreotide. Now another drug is beta blocker, like propranolol and timolol. Propranolol is more commonly used here. Now what is the use of this? It decreases cardiac output by blocking beta-1 receptor and portal pressure by blocking beta-2 receptors. So this is helpful in this type of situation. It is used extensively in adult and we are talking in children now, okay? But at the same time, remember, uh, this management can be extended to the adult also. So in this condition, it is mainly used for adult. Now, what is the dose of this propranolol we should use in the adult. This is a bit of challenging thing because the effect of propranolol is bradycardia. So how much pulse rate okay, is normal when we use this medicine? That's a good question to ask. And the answer is the pulse rate should decrease by at least 25% than before. Okay, And maintain that dose of Propranolol. This is the meaning. So choose one dose. Okay. Take the pulse rate. If you are not satisfied, means if it doesn't drop by 25%, increase the dose of propranolol. By the time you are satisfied, maintain that dose. Okay. This is the meaning. Now, in adult, evidence shows that it decreases the incidence of variceal hemorrhage and improves long-term survival. So it is, it is used as a prophylactic type of drug. The other type of management in case of variceal hemorrhage are endoscopic management. Now I told you before also, endoscopy can be diagnostic, can be therapeutic as well. So this is called therapeutic use of endoscopy. So after, after diagnosing which blood vessel is bleeding, you can sclerose them. This is called sclerosis. Okay. You can fibrose them by injecting some sclerosing substance. And these are ethanolamine oleate, sodium tetradecyl sulfate, or even absolute alcohol. So they are destroying those veins and they can cause fibrosis there. Another way is elastic band ligation. It is just like are treating a case of hemorrhoid. Okay, it is safer and very effective also. So this is endoscopic management. Now another important type of management is Sengstecken Blackmore tube. If pharmacological and endoscopic measures fail or if they are not effective, we go for this type of treatment. Now what is the principle for this type of treatment here? Now, this Sengstecken Blackmore tube is giving compression at that area. And this is like a tamponade effect. It is directly compressing those bleeder and stop the hemorrhage. Now, let us talk about this a little bit more. 
okay now let's let's see this sclerotherapy first okay these are the uh, varices and we inject some sclerosing substance so that uh, they develop fibrosis there another is band ligation okay you put a rubber band at the base so that it will develop ischemia and uh, it will stop the bleeding this is called sangstecken black mold tube you see here there is a long balloon okay which which stays inside the esophagus and the short one stays inside the stomach and there are multiple openings there and there are multiple channels also this is three lumen even four lumen sangstecken black mold tubes are available now so this is very interesting so it is it is uh, showing us exactly how we are going to insert it see that okay so this is the outer end it is inserted from the oral cavity going into the esophagus this is the esophageal balloon okay esophageal balloon now which is dilated there okay it will give constant pressure on the wall of the esophagus so that those bleeding blood vessels will be pressurized and we hope the bleeding will stop see this this is a, a stomach balloon which is also distended there are multiple openings and we can aspirate the things time and again so this is a very effective type of management after uh, this sangstecken black mold tube the final part of the management is left that is surgery okay surgery and regarding the surgery a porto cable shunt is one of them porto cable shunt and this is done to divert the portal blood flow now what is the problem here this is a case of portal hypertension so the forward flow is a problem so that you have to divert this blood to the vena cava and this is done by porto cable shunt another type of shunt is called tips okay tips look at the full form here transjugular intrahepatic porto systemic shunting transjugular intrahepatic porto systemic shunting that is the shunt is placed between right hepatic vein and right or left branch of the portal vein you may be wondering why the term jugular is coming there then the meaning is through the internal jugular vein we are putting the shunt between these two important vein so internal jugular vein is the way for this okay so this is one of the commonly done surgery all over the world another is a esophageal transection that part of the esophagus which is bleeding is cut and removed then it is replaced by prosthesis okay this is esophageal transection uh, this type of surgery is not commonly done in the beginning uh, and this is a last sort of resort liver transplantation is definitely one important you know uh, part of the management especially in case of cirrhosis of the liver uh, uh, we always go for liver transplantation if there are donor available okay now at the end uh, these are the questions and these are the very important questions